It's my uh, honor and um, and my privilege and joy to uh, get to introduce a special guest uh, joining us with this morning, um, my friend Professor Ray Dooley. Uh, Ray is Professor of Dramatic Arts at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, and he is also a, a regular actor with Playmakers Theater. Um, his bio says he's been acting with them since 1989, although it uh, can't possibly be that long. <laughs> so um, welcome, Ray, and we can applaud. <laughs> and. Uh, it's going to share with us a scene from the crucible. Thank you, Tom, for asking me here today, and thank you for the warm welcome I have received. It's an honor to be with you today. The end of Act One of The Crucible by Arthur Miller, where Miller paints a vivid picture of how quick we are to blame the outsider, the stranger among us, and how quickly the blaze of mass hysteria can take dangerous, even lethal form. To set the scene, Salem, Massachusetts, 1691, an upstairs bedroom in the house of the Reverend Paris, the third preacher of the community in 10 years. It's a discordant community. In, uh, in the bed is Paris's daughter, Betty, who has, appears to be comatose. Uh, in the corner, his niece, Abigail, who was found with Betty in the woods previous couple of pre nights previously. Dancing, Abigail had asked the Reverend Paris's black slave, Tituba, who has come with him from Barbados, to conjure, to make a potion in order to kill the wife of the farmer with whom she had had a brief illicit affair. Also in the room are the Thomas and Ann Putnam, who have lost seven children on the first day after they're born. And, one, and their one remaining daughter also was out in the woods. And finally, the Reverend John Hale from a neighboring community, who has been brought in specifically to seek unnatural causes to these unexplained phenomena. Abigail is being questioned and finds herself cornered. The Reverend Hale says, Abigail, what sort of dancing were you doing in the forest? Why, common dancing is all. The Reverend Paris speaks up. Um, I, I think I ought to say that um, I saw a kettle in the grass where they were dancing. Oh, that were only soup. Soup? What sort of soup were in the kettle, Abigail? Why, uh, it, it was beans, I think, and, uh, and lentils. And uh, Mr. Paris, you did not notice any living thing in the soup, a mouse, perhaps, a spider, a frog. They look at Abigail. Oh, th 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 that, that frog jumped in. We, we never put it in. A frog, Abby. Abigail, it may be your cousin is dying. Did you call the devil last night? Abigail cornered. I never called him. She's thinking quickly. She looks around. She knows the answer. Tituba called him. I should like to speak to Tituba. How did she call him? I, I don't know. She spoke her Barbados. Tituba is brought in. I, 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 well, the hail, hail says, why are you concealing to, to Abigail? Have you sold yourself to Lucifer? I never sold myself. I'm a good girl. T she sees Tituba. She made me do it. She made Betty do it. 
Tituba says, Abby, she made me drink blood. And Putnam says, my baby's blood? No, no, chicken blood. I give she chicken blood. Woman, have you enlisted these children for the devil? No, no, sir. I don't have no truck with no devil. Why can she not wake? Are you silencing this child? I love me, Betty. You have, have you sent your spirit out upon this child? You've spent, you have, have you not? Are you gathering souls for the devil? Abigail says, she comes to me every night and to drink blood. Tituba says, you beg me to conjure Abby. She beg me to make charm. Don't lie. I'll tell you something. She comes on me while I sleep. She's always making me dream corruptions. Abby. Oh, I, I, I always hear her laughing in my sleep. I hear her singing her Barbados songs and tempting me. Oh, Mr. Reverend. Tituba, I want you to wake this child. I have no power over this child, sir. You most certainly do, and you will loose her from it now. When did you compact with the devil? I don't compact with no devil. You will confess yourself or I will take you out and whip you with it to your death, Tituba. This woman must be hanged. She must be taken out and hanged. Tituba falls to her knees. She reads the room very quickly. She knows what they want to hear. No, 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 no. Don't hang, Tituba. I tell him I don't desire to work for him, sir. Who? The devil? You've seen him? No, Tituba. I know that when we bind ourselves to hell, it is very hard to break with it entirely. Now we are going to help you free yourself. When the devil comes to you, does he ever come with another person? Perhaps another person in the village, someone you know? Who came with him? Oh, Sarah Good. Did you ever see Sarah Good with him or Osborne? Oh. Oh, when the devil comes, oh, 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 who came with the devil? Two, three, four, how many? Oh, 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 there were, oh, there were, there were four. Oh, 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 there, there were four. Who, who? Their names, their names. Oh, 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 the, the, the devil, uh, he, he, he come to me. He say, oh, you, you work for me, Tituba. You work for me and I make you free. And, 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 and he come to me one stormy night and he say, look, I, 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 have, I have white people working for me. And, and, and I look and, and there was Goody Good oh, and, 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 and Osborne. I knew it, Anne Putnam says. Goody Osborne were midwife to me three times. I begged you, Thomas, did I not? I begged him not to call Osborne because I feared her. My babies always shriveled in her hands. Take courage, Tituba. You must give us all their names. And Abigail, reading the room, too, suddenly says, Oh, I want to open myself. I want the sweet love of Jesus. I danced for the devil. I saw Goody Good with the devil. I saw Goody Osborne with the devil. I saw Bridget Bishop with the devil. And at that point, Betty sits up in the bed. I saw George Jacobs with the devil. I saw Goody Howe with the devil. She speaks. She speaks. Glory to God. It is broken. They are free, says the reverend. Goody Sibber. I saw Goody Sibber with the devil. The marshal. The marshal. Call the marshal. Let the marshal bring irons. I saw Aris Barrow with the devil. I saw Goody Pike with the devil. I saw Goody Hawkins with the devil. I saw Mr. Bell Barton with the devil. I saw Goody Cobb with the devil. I saw Goody Franklin with the devil. I saw Goody Hopper with the devil. And the stage direction says on their ecstatic cries, the curtain falls. End act one. Thank you. So when I learned, wow, that's fantastic. Wow. When I learned that um, Playmakers was performing Arthur Miller's The Crucible, um, in which Ray takes the role of Giles Corey, I had this idea of asking Ray uh, to, to join me and do, do a dialogue sermon with me about the play um, as, as he and, and the, the whole rest of the cast and crew sort of step into this world, step into the pressure cooker of The Crucible surrounded by fear and stress and, and hysteria and distrust. 
And so during the service this morning, Ray and I are going to kind of talk back and forth, and there will be, there will be some improvisation involved, um, at which I think Ray is probably far better than I. <laughs> so I'm going to begin, uh, begin by asking you a question. So it is, it is Salem 1691. And what have you learned from inhabiting this world of the play about what causes people to engage in kind of the monstrous witch hunts that we see in the play? What is, what is it that, that causes people to act this way? Thoughts? In, our rehear- in our rehearsal and research process, what became clear is that, uh, as Miller himself said, he, he was drawn to the interior psychological question of that guilt residing in Salem, which the hysteria merely unleashed but did not create. Uh, Our researchers uh, discovered that when this all broke out in Salem, the surrounding people, the the people in the surrounding towns, weren't particularly surprised because the people in Salem were known as very factious, fractious, uh, quarrelsome, litigious people, uh, very discordant community there. And Miller goes to great lengths in the play to show the individual grievances, quirks, foibles, crotchets of these people, many, much of it surrounding the uh, grabbing for land and wealth, greed. Uh, the seven deadly sins get a nice workout in the, in, in the play and in Salem. There's certainly lust, uh, uh, greed, um, people are lying. It's, uh, it's quite something. So, uh, that's what we discovered, that this, uh, it, it, and as we go through the play, we see this from those individuals, how they are very quarrelsome with each other. So all of this is going underneath the service, like kindling, if you will, at a fire. And then when the Reverend Paris comes in, who is a, blo- uh, a real uh, uh, fire and brimstone preacher, there are either those uh, people who are elect or those people outside the door, the others, the other who must be blamed for this. And when that fractiousness meets his virulent form of fire and brimstone preaching, it's like putting a match to kindling. And all of a sudden, all the factors meet in the one place, and it all starts. Thanks, Ray. It's... um it's really interesting because as you read the history, there's, there's all sorts of different theories about why Salem behaved as it, it did. Everything from, um, like, like Ray mentioned, economic factors, uh, disputes, over, disputes over land and fear about land, um, religious fundamentalism. There's, there's all sorts of theories, though. And one, in one theory uh, proposes that the grain in Salem um, began to rot, and a psychedelic chemical um, emerged in the grain, and that and that what happened was is that the whole town was was mass hallucinating together, um, which is a which is a fascinating that's that's one one bad trip. Um, <laughs> But when I when I did this uh, when I researched it when I researched it in school though there was there's one thing to know about um, about this era in the in the 1690s which is which is that as the Puritans um, came they they were definitely moving from one type of community one type of society to another and that change was very threatening. Um, you can imagine that when in 1630, when the first, first Puritans came over, that, that all the Puritans who willingly came from England, um, you had to be pretty solid in your faith to risk leaving England, coming to a new world, and, um, and sort of what they imagined was it would be a, a city on a hill, to quote John Winthrop. It would be a kind of a religious utopia where they could practice the religion as it was supposed to be practiced. And then what happened is they had kids. <laughs> and, and, it, and it turns out that, that the kids didn't choose to come. They just sort of were there. And, and some of them picked up on the religiosity of their parents. And, and as we know, some kids... 
Some kids didn't. And so you have this tension about how, um, how devout, how, um, you know, how, how diverse or how unified society is going to be. And then they had grandkids. And you can see there is this fear in the older generations that, that they're losing their world that they tried to build, that they're losing the world they tried to build. And you can see in, in the Salem trials that uh, the, first, the first ones accused are all, are all teenagers, teenage girls. Those kids today just don't, just don't understand the way it's supposed to be. You have a thing on that? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, Mar- uh, Professor Mark Perry, who wrote the essay in, in our program, talking about Paris and the effect that, uh, on the children that, that Tom was talking about. Mark writes, Paris doubled down and attacked his enemies as agents of Satan from the pulpit. He spewed out his venom in apocalyptic terms, dividing the world into the elect of God present there in the church and the minions of the devil outside its doors. There were young, impressionable children sitting and taking in all that venom. Within a couple of months, it had done its work. By January, young girls began to erupt into fits, screaming out in pain and claiming bewitchment. These were the same girls who had heard most persistently and passionately the sermons of Reverend Paris. The first two were his own daughter, nine-year-old Betty, and 11-year-old Abigail, his niece. Soon thereafter, they were joined by the children of Paris's closest allies. It seems more their actions were the result of the stoking of fears and superstition in a young and virulent, uh, a, a, a young and vulnerable psyche until extreme physical and emotional contortions burst out. So, of course, we have not only 16. 91. We also have 1953 when the play was written, and we also have 2016 when the play is being performed. And so I, I ask, uh, I just read this question with a, little, with a little wink. Do you think it's any coincidence that the Crucible was chosen as this fall's play at Playmakers? Um, no. <laughs> um, no, uh, Vivian Benesh, our new producing artistic director, quite um, intentionally programmed the show uh, for this period right before the election. Uh, and, it, and she is not alone. There are f- probably half a dozen theaters across the um, a country that are doing this. Uh, Tom mentioned the McCarthy hearings, and here's a quotation from Arthur Miller, which may strike one interestingly today. Regarding McCarthy, Arthur Miller later said, just about anything that flew out of his mouth no matter how outrageously and obviously idiotic, could be made to land in an audience and stir people's terrors. As as Ray was uh, performing, and uh, not sure how he got 12 12 parts in one, one actor, it was amazing. I I thought the where where my mind where my mind went to in that scene um, was actually a moment at the the second presidential debate in which a a Muslim American stands up and asks the candidates whether she and and people like her have a place in America with all of the Islamophobia do is there a place for me in this country. And the response that one of the candidates gives is to tell her that her role and her people's role is to tell on their own people when they notice something, is to name name names, to name names. Sounds, Sounds like that an awful lot, like that, like that scene in the room. It's an answer that made me think about the crucible. And my third question this morning has to do with our response 
to this. So there's, there's 1691 in the witch trials, there's, there's 1953 in the McCarthy hearings, and there's 2016 with, with demonization on the rise, with scapegoating on the rise, with, uh, with witch hunts of various sorts. And so I want to ask you, Ray, as an actor, you've inhabited this terrifying world of the crucible. And so tell me what you've learned, not only about being an actor, but, but, but about being a moral actor. A, a moral actor capable of resisting mass hysteria, resisting demonization. The uh, characters who fare best in the play, Rebecca Nurse, an older woman in her 70s. Um, the character that I play, Giles Corey, who happens to be 83 years old and refuses to plead innocent or guilty and is tortured to death uh, because he refuses to plead so that his sons will inherit his farm and, not, and it won't revert to the government where it will be put up for auction. And uh, the main hero, John Proctor, who fights, really struggles in his soul as to whether he will confess and be saved because he loves his wife dearly or whether he will take the moral stance. And uh, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> it, it, it come, it's a very narrow question. Um, but finally, he screams out, they, they want to, he's, he, he confesses to save his life. Then they want him to sign a document. He says, why must I sign? Well, it has to be signed. So he signs the document. Then he won't give them the document. They want to pin it up on the door of the church to, as an example. And he says, what difference does it make? He says, your name is important. And he goes, no, you can't have my name. Why? Because it is my name, he says. And those three characters, and then Elizabeth at the end, we think maybe as well. Her last line is, he ha when John finally tears up the document and is let out to be hanged, they're screaming at her, help me, convince him, convince him, change his mind. And he goes, she goes, he hath his goodness now. God forbid I should take it from him. So those who stand individual conscience seems to be all that stands against this tide, this flood of hysteria. And none of those characters, two are hanged and one is tortured to death, but they are clearly, in Miller's view, the heroes of this play. And the, the, those people who equivocate, those people who make excuses, those people who go along, uh, really do not fare well in this play at all. This document is interesting, Tom. Would you mind if I read yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, in the, as, as you may know, Salem is now a um, tourist uh, a destination. And they're, I was on their website yesterday, and they're putting a big warning about how crowded it's going to be for Halloween. So that's there's a tr different transition going on. But one of, the, uh, uh, one of the exhibits there is called the Witch House, and it was the house of... Jonathan Corwin, who was one of the Salem judges, and you can go around and see how the, how the people lived there. On the wall, the curators have put a document that says, why are the witch trials important today? Tom, why don't we take, take, take turns here? Why don't you take the first one here? All right. Could the hysteria that swept Salem in 1692 happen again? Under different guises, do events like what happened here take place in our modern world? Human beings tend to react very dangerously when experiencing a heightened state of fear, especially when that fear is experienced for prolonged periods of time. Throughout history, when one group perceives a danger or threat from another group, mankind is capable of great cruelty in our effort to nullify or remove that threat. We consent to acts that bring dire consequences in our attempts to control our circumstances, our fortunes, and engineer their improvement. Where in our modern daily lives do we perceive threats? Where in our world are people experiencing and reacting to fear? 
from ongoing persecution of child witches in Africa to global terrorism to classroom and cyberbullying, we are still surrounded with events that marginalize the group or individual through acts of violence and domination. It is hoped that we could learn from the lessons of 1692 Salem and respond to our modern and changing world more favorably. And I think that is a fitting benediction for the morning. Yes. Ray, we are delighted by your presence this morning. Thank you so, so much.